Okay, so I've got a very simple question for you for today. How hard actually is technology? We are surrounded every day by machines of incredible complexity right now. We barely know how they work or how to repair them. But, well, it wasn't always like that. During the last 50 years, we've accomplished so many things using uh, either simple technolo technology or very advanced. For example, we have landed on the moon. And not once, but six times. Six times the man was walking on the moon. Of course, those lunar missions had also some funny moments. Uh, once, for example, an astronaut was driving the lunar rover, you know, the little car that goes on the moon, and suddenly a fender came off. A fender is a piece of, well, plastic that covers the wheel. It protects it from the dust from the lunar surface. And, as you can see, uh, it broke off, and what would you do if you are half a million kilometers from home, from the nearest pit stop, and suddenly your car breaks down? He asked his pilot in the lander, hey, do we have some duct tape? And they fixed it using duct tape. It, of course, lasted only five minutes, but later on they create a second version of it using paper and duct tape, and this one lasted for a day. It was enough. They got to the moon using the highest technology possible at the time, so complex, and yet when it came to repairs, they only had to use duct tape, because it was available, because they were able to do this. You may think that, well, things changed, we've got more potent technology right now. Not really. When it comes to some things, we are still using the simplest possible solution. For example, on the space station. You are writing something down with your pen. No gravity, you are just floating in the air. If you will leave your pen on the desk, it will float off. It can cause some serious damage to the station, it will fly off. So what would you do? Well, you just tape it down to the desk. You take a piece of silver tape and you tape it literally down to the desk. Simple solution for a well, simple problem, surrounded by very advanced technology. You may think that it's far-fetched. Not really. Have you seen, for example, The Martian, the movie with Matt Damon? A single man stranded on another planet, alone? Yeah. What does he do? For example, spoilers, when half of the building is blown off, how does he repair it? He takes some foil, some silver tape, and he patches it to make it airtight. Airtight enough for just a couple of hours. But that's enough. You may think this is science fiction. Well, engineers actually do this all the time, when it comes to prototypes, when it comes to making just something for visualization. And we sometimes make a competition out of it. For example, there is a thing called the Dyson Challenge. It's a competition when you are given only cardboard, a lot of hot glue, and electronics, motors, microcontrollers, and you have to make a remotely controlled car that will go through fire, water, different types of labyrinths, obstacles. It has to maneuver very fastly because it's a challenge, it's a race. And you do it using cardboard and hot glue. Yeah, because you can. Because it's fun sometimes to improvise. Of course, you can ask yourself, can I do, for example, the hull of the, ro of the little robot, so the chassis, from another material? 3D printing, of course, comes to mind. This is a, an emerging technology, we heard it five minutes ago, but, well, it's actually 30 years old. First 3D printers came out, the prototypes, during the 80s. So why didn't we bought it back then? Why, didn't we, why did we have to, well, wait for almost 30 years to get 3D printers? Well, it's actually the same as cell phones. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, when you look at cell phones, Cell phones about 20 years ago were just dumb phones. You were looking at your phone and it was only used for calling some friends. Later on, we demanded that the phones have to do some more things. Have to have calendars, some meetings and everything. And they evolved slowly, step by step, sometimes very painful steps. You remember first smartphones, they weren't as good as we thought they would be. So, but we wanted better phones. And right now, in your pockets, you've got the most potent, compact supercomputer ever built. What can you do with it? 
You can calculate the trajectories of planets around the sun. You can, right now, check the weather in Uruguay, for example. What do you do mostly? You check the funny movies of cats on the internet. Yeah, we are guilty, all of us. Uh, but uh, this is uh, an everyday solution. So you use it for everyday problems. You just pick up a phone. Another emerging technology, of course, is virtual reality. You remember Oculus? Yeah. It is a shiny, beautiful technology. You can play it right now. It's brilliant, simply. But you must know that it started also as a prototype, as a dirty prototype, a single screen with Chinese electronics strapped to it and some sensors and a lot of black tape. Yeah, we use tape all the time for prototypes. It's very sturdy. It's good. And it's, it's only for five minutes, but it works. And now, this was a prototype that was sold to investors. The second prototype was sold actually to even more investors. It gathered millions of dollars of support for the producer. And, you know, it was better. It was made with red tape this time. <laughs> you may ask yourself, uh, could he, the creator, the original one, could he have made it using, for example, I don't know, 3D printing? Yeah, he could. Of course, it would have looked better, but it would have, of course, took, uh, taken some more time, more thought to it. He needed something dirty, fast, five-minute solution, so only for those five minutes to show it off. It's enough. And I heard once at the conference from another professor from the United States a quite nice story about, well, doing things quickly. They've got a laboratory over there and they were stocked with 3D printers, but they were printing only using orange plastic. Why? To keep track, actually, of what they have done by themselves. What have they designed by themselves and what is bought of the market? And Always, when you enter the laboratory, they warned you, everything that is orange was made by us. In a quick, dirty way, but was made by us. And when you actually took a step and walked into the laboratory, everything was orange. Yeah, even some wheels on a table. They've made everything by themselves. Why? Because they could. It was a fast solution. It took you a couple of minutes to design something and just print it and they kept track of what they are doing. They could uh, always improve things if they wanted, because they designed it. You may think that it is now, only now, that we are constantly improving our prototypes. No, it's a little bit longer history than that. For example, uh, in the early 40s and 50s, the famous, maybe the famous physicist of all time, Richard Feynman, you know him, of quantum physics, he was working on particle accelerators. He was a student still back then. Uh, the particle accelerator he was working on is called a cyclotron. At the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they had a huge cyclotron. It took one room to have it there, and in the second room, you were just sitting with the controls, with all the sliders, all the buttons. It was beautiful, made with metal, so fancy. But they heard that there is a better cyclotron in America, and it was in Princeton. So his supervisor told him to go there, visit them, and, well, learn what do they do with their cyclotron. When he entered the university, he asked, where is the particle accelerator? In the basement. What? In the basement? Okay, so he went down to the basement, and he entered a smallish room with a very small machine uh, in, the, in the middle of it. There was water dripping from the ceiling. There were a mess of cables on the floor. Everything was dirty. Not like in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In Princeton, they had a very small machine, very dirty, but they had better results. They had better experiments than anyone else in the America. Why? Because they made it themselves. They didn't bother. When they wanted to change something, actually, they just changed it. They wanted better vacuum, they just put a bucket of paint over it so it will be airtight. They had very simple solutions to, well, dif difficult problems. It only, well, lasted for five minutes, the better vacuum inside, but it was enough. Sometimes you just need those magic five minutes of a working prototype. Okay, and if we just need only five minute solutions, 
uh, do you think that we are, for example, met sometimes with those silly problems that you only need to design on a desk? Yeah, we do. For example, I was once asked by two students from design studies, yeah, the arts. They were curious if can, if it, whether they can make a walking robot, a two-legged machine that will walk only forward and backward. Well, they wanted it to be artful. And I, well, just well, thought to myself, can we actually do it? A very simple machine that a student will accomplish. Yeah, I googled it. And five minutes later, I was printing on a normal printer with paper a sketch of a machine that will walk only forward, backward, and will use only one electric motor or a hand crank mechanism. It's not that difficult. Later on, of course, the next day, I made it with cardboard. You can see the prototype over there with the paper. This is the, that prototype. I later on made, remade it using cardboard, electric motor, but the idea was, well, enough. You just print it out and it works. You just need to do it, actually. It's easy. So, uh, I attached to this robot an electronic that was about $5 worth, and it made the robot walk forward and backward. So, can you do it, for example, in your free time? Yeah, you can. You can go to the internet, to some auction site, buy electronics. You can learn a programming language over a course of a single weekend. There are tutorials everywhere on the web. You can actually do it. And then you can attach everything together in one day and make a mobile robot for yourself. Think of it. 20 years ago, when the cell phones started, actually, uh, we, well, we didn't do anything with them. But then it changed. We got smartphones, and right now, you've got beautiful supercomputers in your pockets. 10 years ago, nobody thought of 3D printers, for example, in your kitchen. Right now, you can go and buy a 3D printer at the price of a good refrigerator, and you can have it in your home. Ten years ago, you didn't think that you would have virtual reality goggles like Oculus. Right now, you have them. If we are currently able to create a robot at our homes with technology like this, with cardboard, duct tape and motors, electric motors, what will happen in ten years? What will happen in twenty? If we keep going, if we keep constantly building prototypes, even in our home, own homes, the companies will try to, well, keep, it, keep up with our pace. They will build better robots that will be affordable, that you will be able to buy. You just have to keep the momentum. So, go build a robot. It's not that hard, really. Thank you.